Kate Chopin, Her Letters. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Her Letters, Kate Chopin. She had given orders that she wished to remain undisturbed, and moreover had locked the doors of her room. The house was very still. The rain was falling steadily from a laden sky in which there was no gleam, no rift, no promise. A generous wood fire had been lighted in the ample fireplace, and it brightened and illumined the luxurious apartment to its furthermost corners. From some remote nook of her writing desk, the woman took a thick bundle of letters, bound tightly together with strong, coarse twine, and placed it upon the table in the center of the room. For weeks she had been schooling herself for what she was about to do. There was a strong deliberation in the lines of her long, thin, sensitive face. Her hands, too, were long and delicate and blue-veined. With a pair of scissors she snapped the cord binding the letters together. Thus released, the ones which were topmost slid down to the table, and she, with a quick movement, thrust her fingers among them, scattering and turning them over till they quite covered the broad surface of the table. Before her were envelopes of various sizes and shapes, all of them addressed in the handwriting of one man and one woman. He had sent her letters all back to her one day, when, sick with dread of possibilities, she had asked to have them returned. She had meant then to destroy them all, his and her own. That was four years ago, and she had been feeding upon them ever since. They had sustained her, she believed, and kept her spirit from perishing utterly. Now the day had come when the premonition of danger could no longer remain unheeded. She knew that before many months were passed she would have to part from her treasure, leaving it unguarded. She shrank from inflicting the pain, the anguish which the discovery of these letters would bring to others, to one above all who was near to her, and whose tenderness and years of devotion had made him in a manner dear to her. She calmly selected a letter at random from the pile and cast it into the roaring fire. A second one followed almost as calmly. With the third, her hand began to tremble, when in a sudden paroxysm she cast a fourth, a fifth, and a sixth into the flames in breathless succession. Then she stopped and began to pant, for she was far from strong, and she stayed staring into the fire with pained and savage eyes. Oh, what had she done? What had she not done? With feverish apprehension, she began to search among the letters before her. Which of them had she so ruthlessly, so cruelly put out of her existence? Heaven grant not the first, that very first one written before they had learned or dared to say to each other, I love you. No, no, there it was, safe enough. She laughed with pleasure and held it to her lips. Well, what if that other most precious and most imprudent one was missing, in which every word of untempered passion had long ago eaten its way into her brain and which stirred her still today, as it had done a hundred times before when she thought of it. She crushed it between her palms when she found it. She kissed it again and again. With her sharp white teeth she tore the far corner from the letter where the name was written. She bit the torn scrap and tasted it between her lips and upon her tongue like some God-given morsel. What unbounded thankfulness she felt at not having destroyed them all. How desolate and empty would have been her remaining days without them, with only her thoughts, elusive thoughts that she could not hold in her hands and press as she did these to her cheeks and her heart. This man had changed the water in her veins to wine whose taste had brought delirium to both of them. It was all one and past now, save for these letters that she held encircled in her arms. She stayed breathing softly and contentedly, and with the hectic cheek resting upon them. She was thinking, thinking of a way to keep them without possible ultimate injury to that other one, whom they would stab more cruelly than keen knife blades. 
At last she felt the way. It was a way that frightened and bewildered her to think of at first, but she'd reached it by deduction too sure to admit of doubt. She meant, of course, to destroy them herself before the end came, but how does the end come, and when? Who can tell? She would guard again the possibility of accident by leaving them in charge of the very one who, above all, should be spared a knowledge of their contents. She roused herself from the stupor of thought and gathered the scattered letters once more together, binding them again with a tough twine. She wrapped the compact bundle on a tight sheet of white polished paper. Then she wrote in ink upon the back of it in large, firm characters. I leave this package to the care of my husband. With perfect faith in his loyalty and his love, I ask him to destroy it unopened. It was not sealed. Only a bit of string held the wrapper, which she could remove and replace at will whenever the humor came to her to pass an hour in some intoxicating dream of the days when she felt she had lived. If he had come upon that bundle of letters in the first flush of his poignant sorrow, there would not have been an instant's hesitancy. To destroy it promptly and without question would have seemed a welcome expression of devotion, a way of reaching her, of crying out his love to her, while the world was still filled with the illusion of her presence. But months had passed since that spring day when they had found her stretched upon the floor, clutching the key of a writing desk, which she appeared to have been attempting to reach when death overtook her. The day was much like that day a year ago when the leaves were falling and the rain pouring steadily from the leaden sky which held no gleam, no promise. He had happened accidentally upon the package in that remote nook of her desk. Just as she herself had done a year ago, he carried it to the table and laid it down there staring with puzzled eyes at the message which confronted him. I leave this package to the care of my husband. With perfect faith in his loyalty and his love, I ask him to destroy it unopened. She had made no mistake. Every line of his face, no longer young, spoke loyalty and honesty, and his eyes were as faithful as a dog's and his loving. He was a tall, powerful man, standing there in the firelight with shoulders that stooped a little and hair that was growing somewhat thin and gray and a face that was distinguished and must have been handsome when he smiled. But he was slow. Destroy it unopened, he reread, half aloud, but why unopened? He took the package again in his hands and turning it about and feeling it discovered that it was composed of many letters tightly packed together. So here were her letters which she was asking him to destroy and open. She had never seemed in her lifetime to have had a secret from him. He knew her to have been cold and passionless, but true and watchful of his comfort and his happiness. Might he not be holding in his hands the secret of some other one which had been confided to her and which she had promised to guard? But no, she would have indicated the fact by some additional line or word. The secret was her own, something contained in these letters, and she wanted it to die with her. If he could have thought of her as on some distant, shadowy shore waiting for him throughout the years with outstretched hands to come and join her again, he would not have hesitated. With hopeful confidence, he would have thought, In that blessed meeting time, soul, soul, she would tell me all. Till then I can wait and trust. But he could not think of her in any far-off paradise awaiting him. He felt that there was no smallest part of her anywhere in the universe, more than there had been before she was born into the world. But she had embodied herself with terrible significance and an intangible wish uttered when life still coursed through her veins, knowing that would reach him when the annihilation of death was between them, but uttered with all confidence in its power and potency. He was moved by the splendid daring, the magnificence of the act, which at the same time exalted him and lifted him above the head of common mortals. 
What secret save one could a woman choose to have die with her? As quickly as the suggestion came to his mind, so swiftly did the man instinct of possession creep into his blood. His fingers cramped about the package in his hands, and he sank into a chair beside the table. The agonizing suspicion that perhaps another hand shared with him, her thoughts, her affection, her life, deprived him for a swift instant of honor and reason. He thrust the end of his strong thumb beneath the string, which with a single turn would have yielded with perfect faith in your loyalty and your love. It was not the written characters addressing themselves to the eye. It was like a voice speaking to his soul. With a tremor of anguish, he bowed his head down upon the letters. He had once seen a clairvoyant hold a letter to his forehead and purport in doing so to discover its contents. He wondered for a wild moment if such a gift for force of wishing might come to him. But he was only conscious of the smooth surface of the paper, cold against his brow like a touch of a dead woman's hand. A half hour passed before he lifted his head. An unspeakable conflict had raged within him, but his loyalty and his love had conquered. His face was pale and deep lined with suffering, but there was no more hesitancy to be seen there. He did not for a moment think of casting the thick package into the flames to be licked by the fiery tongue and charred and half revealed to his eyes. That was not what she meant. He arose and taking a heavy bronze paperweight from the table, bound it securely to the package. He walked to the window, looked out into the street below. Darkness had come and it was still raining. He could hear the rain dashing against the window panes and could see it falling through the dull yellow rim of light cast by the lighted street lamp. He prepared himself to go out and when quite ready to leave the house, thrust the weighted package into the deep pocket of his top coat. He did not hurry along the street as most people were doing at that hour, but walked with long, slow, deliberate steps, not seeming to mind the penetrating chill and rain driving into his face despite the shelter of his umbrella. His dwelling was not far removed from the business section of the city, and it was not a great while before he found himself at the entrance of the bridge that spanned the river, the deep, broad, swift, black river dividing two states. He walked on and out to the very center of the structure. The wind was blowing fiercely and keenly. The darkness where he stood was impenetrable. The thousand of lights in the city he had left seemed like all the stars of heavens massed together, sinking into some distant, mysterious horizon, leaving him alone in a black, boundless universe. He drew the package from his pocket and, leaning as far as he could over the broad stone rail of the bridge, cast it from him into the river. It fell straight and swiftly from his hand. He could not follow its descent from the darkness, nor hear, hear its dip into the water far below. It vanished silently, seemingly into some inky, unfathomable space. He felt as if he were flinging it back to her in that unknown world whither she had gone. An hour or two later, he sat at his table in the company of several men whom he had invited that day to dine with him. A secret had settled upon his spirit, a conviction, a certitude that there could be but one secret which a woman would choose to have die with her. This one thought was possessing him. It occupied his brain, keeping it nimble and alert with suspicion. It clutched his heart, making every breath of existence a fresh moment of pain. The men about him were no longer the friends of yesterday. In each one he discerned a possible enemy. He tended absolutely to their talk. He was remembering how she had conducted herself toward this one and that one, striving to recall conversation, subtleties of facial expressions that might have meant what he did not suspect at the moment, shades of meeting in words that seemed the ordinary interchange of social amenities. He led the conversation to the subject of women, probing those men for their opinions and experiences. There was not one but claimed some infallible power to command the affections of any woman whom his fancy might select. 
He had heard the empty boast before from the same group and had always met it with good-humored contempt. But, but tonight every flagrant inane utterance was charged with a new meaning, revealing possibilities that he had hitherto never taken into account. He was glad when they were gone. He was eager to be alone, not from any desire or intention to sleep. He was impatient to regain her room, that room in which she had lived a large portion of her life and where he had found these letters. There must surely be some of them somewhere, he thought, some forgotten scrap, some written thought or expression lying unguarded by an invisible command. At the hour when he usually retired for the night, he set himself down before her writing desk and began the search of drawers, slides, pigeonholes, nooks, and corners. He did not leave a scrap of anything unread. Many of the letters which he found were old. Some he had read before. Others were new to him. But in none did he find the faintest evidence that his wife had not been the true and loyal woman he had always believed her to be. The night was nearly spent before the fruitless search ended. The brief troubled sleep which he snatched before his hour for rising was freighted freight, with feverish, grotesque dreams, though all of which he could hear and could see dimly the dark river rushing by, carrying away his heart, his ambitions, his life. But it was not alone in letters that women betrayed their emotions, he thought. Often he had known them, especially when in love, to mark fugitive sentimental passages in books of verse or prose thus expressing and revealing their own hidden thought. Might she not have done this? Then began a second and far more exhausting and arduous quest than the first, turning page by page the volumes that crowded her room, books of fiction, poetry, philosophy. She had read them all, but nowhere by the shadow of a sign could he find that the author had echoed the secrets of her existence the secret which he had held in his hands and had cast into the river. He began cautiously and gradually to question this one and that one, striving to learn by indirect ways which each had thought of her. For the most he learned she had been unsympathetic because of her coldness of manner. One had admired her intellect, another her accomplishments. A third had thought her beautiful before disease claimed her, regretting, however, that her beauty had lacked warmth of color and expression. She was praised by some for gentleness and kindness, and by others for cleverness and tact. Oh, it was useless to try to discover anything from men he might have known. It was women who would talk of what they knew. They did talk unreservedly. Most of them had loved her. Those who had not had held her in respect and esteem. And yet, and yet, there is but one secret which a woman would choose to have die with her, was the thought which continued to haunt him and deprive him of rest, days and nights of uncertainty being slowly to unnerve him and torture him. An assurance of the worst that he dreaded would have offered him peace to most welcome, even at the price of happiness. It seemed no longer of any moment to him that men should come and go and fall or rise in the world and wed and die. It did not signify if money came to him by a turn of chance or eluded him. Empty and meaningless seemed to him all devices which the world offers for men's entertainment. The food and the drink set before him had lost their flavor. He did not longer know or care if the sun shone or the clouds lowered him. A cruel hazard had struck him there where he was weakest, shattering his whole being, leaving him with but one wish in his soul, one gnawing desire to know the mystery which he had held in his hands and cast into the river. One night when there was no star shining, he wandered restlessly upon the streets. He no longer sought to know from men or women what they dared not or could not tell him. Only the river knew. He went and stood again upon the bridge where he had stood many an hour since that night when the darkness then had closed around him and engulfed his manhood. Only the river knew. It babbled and he listened to it and told him nothing, 
but it promised all. He could hear it promising him with caressing voice, peace and sweet repose. He could hear the sweep, the song of the water inviting him. A moment more and he had gone to seek her and to join her and her secret thought and the immeasurable rest.